Hey guys, welcome back to the Watch Charts YouTube channel. I'm recording this video today because I wanted to share some key details that were just recently confirmed by Rolex themselves uh, in regards to how the certified pre-owned program that they recently announced would work. And some of these questions were ones that you guys had addressed to us in our podcast uh, episode where we talked about Rolex CPO just a few days ago. In case you missed that, the full episode recording is available uh, on our YouTube channel, and there will be a link uh, in the top right-hand corner of the video now, so you guys can go check it out. But at the time of the recording, a lot of these questions we didn't actually have confirmation about, and we just sort of speculated on how the program might be operated uh, based on you know what we reasonably expect. So shortly after we published the podcast episode, I received an email from Danny over at rolexmagazine.com, and he said that he had been in contact with a representative from Rolex themselves in Geneva, and uh, they had confirmed or clarified on some key details on how the program would operate. He posted a Q&A article on the Rolex Magazine website, and in this video, we're going to be going over the details that were revealed, and I'll give you guys my take on what is now confirmed by Rolex. So again, big thanks to Danny. Definitely go check out rolexmagazine.com if you're interested in daily Rolex content. So the biggest piece of news is that Rolex has confirmed that the certified pre-owned program dealers will be allowed to sell the CPO watches online. To further clarify that point, Rolex says that the watches can only be sold through the authorized dealers' websites themselves. They will not be permitted to list the watches on third-party marketplaces such as eBay or Kernel24. I think that's about what everyone expects. Um, and the other thing is that Rolex has given authorized dealers full freedom to set the price of the CPO watches however they want. Rolex has confirmed that they have no influence on what the pricing will be. So I think this is really significant for a few reasons. First of all, it confirms that the Rolex CPO program is basically a white labeling program. Uh, Rolex, it doesn't seem like, is getting involved in the operations of the pre-owned business at all. They are relying on the authorized dealers in their existing network that have an existing used watch business. And they're basically saying, let's rebrand that used watch business, you know, for example, under the Boucher name as it is now, to the Rolex used watch program. So in that sense, from an operational standpoint, it basically seems like it's going to be business as usual. How is Rolex going to make money from this program? Well, this we don't know for sure, but presumably I would guess they would receive some sort of cut again to be able to use the Rolex name. So on the topic of servicing, as we know, Rolex has said that there's going to be a two-year warranty uh, included with every CPO watch sale. But there was also some questions around the level of pre-sale service that they would be receiving. So what is the process between when a Rolex CPO dealer takes in a watch and what it goes through before it's actually listed for sale as Rolex CPO? Rolex is saying that their authorized dealers are not required to service every single CPO watch that comes through the door. So there's not going to be a standard level of service that is required for every single watch. Uh, they're saying that CPO watches will be polished slash serviced, quote unquote, if necessary. And that basically just seems like that it's leaving it up to the dealer's discretion if they want to service it or not. I guess Rolex is trusting that their dealers will have a certain level of quality assurance when it comes to making that decision. If a service is deemed to be necessary, the dealers will have three options on how to get it performed. First, they can send the watch to Rolex Geneva themselves. Second, they can send the watch to a Rolex service center. And third, the authorized dealers can do the service themselves if they have a Rolex certified watchmaker on staff. So this is a little bit disappointing, but I think also not entirely unexpected. I think if Rolex had made some guarantee about every single CPO watch uh, receiving a standard full mechanical service before being sold as CPO, then it would actually bring a lot of value to the program. It's basically resetting the Rolex suggested service interval, which I believe right now is 10 years. And it's saying that every single watch going out the door, you're guaranteed it's basically good for that amount of time. So unfortunately, they're not doing that. But as I said, I don't think it's entirely unexpected because I think it would severely increase the turnaround time that the CPO dealers are able to get inventory in and out the door. 
And also, again, this is in line with the white labeling program. Rolex, I think, is not trying to affect how the CPO dealers are doing their existing pre-owned business too much outside of the mandate that every single CPO watch must be at least three years old just to prevent blatant flipping. There was also a question in the podcast about CPO affecting new watch availability. The idea was that if watchmakers employed at Rolex would now have this increased uh, volume of CPO watches that they would need to service, would that potentially affect their ability to make new watches? So on that point, Rolex does operate sort of the watchmaking, the production side of their business separate from the service side. So I think in the short term, there might not be really any sort of impact. But longer term, if Rolex is seeing a lot of demand for the CPO program, then yes, maybe they would need to slowly allocate a larger proportion of watchmakers to that as opposed to creating new watches or just hire more watchmakers overall. But I think it's too hard to say anything definitively there. So I think there's quite a few interesting conclusions to draw now that we know that Rolex themselves has confirmed these points. And of course, the biggest thing that everyone wants to know is how will this affect the broader secondary market? Originally, when we recorded the podcast, we said that maybe the impact would not be so great because right now there's only a couple hundred CPO watches for sale uh, just from Butcher, and it was unclear at that time the extent to which um, Rolex authorized dealers would get involved in the CPO business. But knowing what we know now, I think we can pretty confidently say that any existing Rolex authorized dealer that is currently doing some pre-owned business would be inclined to join the Rolex CPO program as, again, it's not really, I think, affecting the way that they operate. It's more just a white labeling program, a rebrand of their existing business. Now, I don't know how many Rolex authorized dealers globally do run a pre-owned business. I don't expect it to be a significant portion, but this is giving them clear incentive to maybe think towards going that direction, especially considering the level of freedom that they have in how they want to operate it. This means that Rolex CPO dealers will be competing directly with other secondary market dealers on the open market online. Prices will be relatively transparent. I fully expect, as Butcher has already done, for the CPO prices to be listed online if the inventory is going to be listed and available for sale online, of course. And this means that we can continue to track what the discrepancy between Rolex CPO and non-CPO prices are to see what the premium is and whether it's worth it. In the short term, I also think that it's feasible that Rolex CPO may drive up secondary market prices. Again, given how compelling a trade-in experience that doesn't involve a third party is to a large portion of Rolex consumers, which are not collectors or enthusiasts, I think that a lot of them are going to be inclined to just go through that trade-in program and have the watch be listed as CPO, as opposed to maybe today where they would sell it to a, another secondary market dealer. So this means that non-CPO supply, as more Rolex authorized dealers join the CPO program, may actually decrease because a lot of these people are just trading in their watches to CPO instead of selling them to other secondary market dealers. CPO may also push pricing up aggressively. The prices for these dealers already, I think, even before Rolex CPO was announced, were probably on the higher side of the used watch market. And now, given the further credibility that they have under the Rolex CPO brand name, they're going to look to drive up prices even further to see how much they can stretch things with that new reputation. And so this may actually cause non-CPO dealers to potentially raise prices as well. Again, there might be a decrease in the amount of stock that they have. And if Rolex CPO prices are significantly higher than comparable non-CPO listings, then those dealers may look to close the gap and use the Rolex CPO pricing as justification for raising prices themselves even more. So let me know what you guys think. Do you agree with the analysis that CPO may cause secondary market prices to increase? Or do you think that maybe it could potentially be a good thing for the market by creating more competition between the secondary market CPO versus non-CPO dealers? Drop all your comments below. Thanks so much for listening. Subscribe if you liked the video. Catch you guys next time.